and if you have any questions please do add them into the chat box um, and we will try to address them as we go along or afterwards um, so this morning we uh, this this workshop is part of an ongoing innovate uk project and we've got uh, presenters from the three partners involved um, so there's uh, Mario from Sorex uh, Sensors, who's going to talk uh, later on this morning. Um, we've got a couple of people from Roth Rothamsted presenting, and we've got uh, myself and Sam from ADAS. Um, the focus of today's webinar is on is aphids, and as we all know, aphids are a major problem in the UK, um, reducing yields directly and also through um, transmission of diseases. Um, and we are looking at some novel approaches to monitoring aphid infestations uh, and as part of that we are reviewing current systems and future advances um, and looking at developing a particular new sensor which you'll hear about this morning. So today uh, what we're going to focus on is monitoring options including forecasting and infield sensors for aphid pests. Now first of all we're going to um, start with a short survey for everyone to complete and this is really just to get everyone engaged, but also so we can better understand uh, what the current experience of aphid monitoring is uh, and where future developments could be really helpful. So we'll, we'll start off with that. Um, and then Sam's going to give us an update on BYDV management option um, monitoring. Uh, <clears throat> in a slight change to the agenda, we'll have uh, a recording from James Bell on aphid surveys and forecasts at Rothamsted. Uh, and then Steve Foster is going to give an update on insecticide resistance monitoring. Uh, and then Mario will talk about the uh, new novel aphid sensor that we're currently developing, or they're currently developing and we're supporting. So just to start off, uh, we'll have this short um, survey. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put into the chat a link to a form that you can fill in as we go along. Just paste that in now. So what I'd like for you to do is open up that uh, link. And there'll be a, a series of, um, of, of questions there. Um, the first question is um, whether you're happy or not to complete the survey. Uh, if you're not happy to do so, please, please don't accept the terms and, and you can just listen to the rest of this. Um, but uh, we would really uh, encourage you to take part because it'll help you think about what were the, the upcoming talks, but also give us an idea of um, uh, of, uh, of of your experience as well. So the first couple of questions. Sorry, I've got a slide, uh, slide up there. First couple of questions are just about your role in the sector you work in. We're not collecting any personal data or anything that uh, we could match data back to you individually. Uh, your responses are completely anonymous. If you want to skip a question, you can skip a question. Um, the data is going to be used to improve future developments and monitoring practices as part of this Innovate project. And, uh, and we will share the results at the end of this webinar. We'll go through what you all responded uh, and, um, and we can see what the general feedback was. Um, so if I can ask you to complete that first section, first of all. And I'll give you a minute or two to do that um, and then we'll and then if you click on to the next bit, it'll take you to the first question. If anyone's having any, having any trouble with that, please do um, put something into the chat so we can see and I can help you address it. Hopefully it's fairly straightforward. Um, so while you're doing that, I will start on the on the first um, question, which is around what your current um, experiences of of monitoring. So. All we'd like to know that you'll come to a, a question and there'll be um, a scale of response for each of these uh, items. So uh, if you don't experience this uh, problem at all, then you would say uh, select one on the, on the left. And if you ever uh, experience this a lot, then you go to write FR on the right and select five. So we're interested in um, 
do you find that economic thresholds for aphids are not fit for purpose or do you find that monitoring aphids in multiple locations takes too long or monitoring on different days is too much of a challenge because on a cold day the monitoring is very different from on a warmer day do you find it takes too long to collect aphid data and review it in order to make timely decisions um, do you find monitoring low levels of infestation is too difficult and do you find that remote monitoring, so such as the um, data from suction traps, do you find that that simply doesn't represent what you find on your farm? Uh, I should say if you're, these are targeted at farmer um, on farm uh, decisions. Um, so if you don't work on farm, please use your experience of uh, interacting with farmers. That's fine as well. Again, if there's any issues you're coming across, please um, pop them in the chat. Otherwise, I'll assume everyone's getting on with this without issue. Um, if everyone's happy, I'll move along to the, the next slide. And the next question is about what monitoring methods you've tried in the past. Again, if you uh, put down uh, either you don't use this at all or use this a lot. And try and put down extremes. So five means you're using it an awful lot all the time whenever you have the opportunity one would mean you absolutely never ever touch a sticky trap and you know, um and you have no experience of them so and then everything in between to to uh, to cover the, the different scale of use so we're looking at um whether you are currently using physical operate, uh, observations of pests on crop walks using sticky traps using pitfall or water traps pheromone traps um drone gathered data from ground based drones or from airborne drones um, using pest forecasts such as the HDB BYDV TSUM model. Whether you're using information from regional monitoring such as a suction trap network or a visual remote sensing such as crop cameras. I appreciate they are not really available for aphids um, or whether you're using associated indicators such as growth stage or other crop visual indicators. Um, rather than looking for the aphids themselves and whether you're using bulletins and podcasts to, to uh, know when pests might be occurring. The next question is about how you select aphid monitoring methods. So are you selecting methods that are commonly used by people around you or the, do you go for the best value for money or the easiest uh, to do? or the quickest to do. So it might be that they're um, quick to quick to set up, but take a bit of technical information. Um, do you prioritize using systems that give you real data on current abundance in the field, or are you more interested in systems that predict changes in the future? Do you want systems that have a clear indication of what you need to do next? So for example, the BYDVT sum model gives a clear idea that um, treatment might be required if the threshold is is exceeded. Um, do you look for systems that give you a good idea of insect resistance? And do you look for systems that can be used in combination with other monitoring activities, so for other pests or um, other systems? I should say there's only a couple more questions of these, so th this isn't the whole webinar. <laughs> we, are, we are moving through them. So this is the fourth question. So what do you see as the most feasible way of applying, say, sensors for monitoring on farm? So would you like to have sensors that link to your mobile phone so you can do them uh, around the farm as you go around? Or do you prefer sensors that are mounted onto the tractor um, that can map, it and map um, aphids or other pests? Do you prefer ground-based drones that you can just set loose into a field to collect data or airborne drones that can do the same but above ground? Would you be, um, do you see the most feasible option as being multiple fixed monitoring stations across your farm, perhaps one per field or multiple per field, or would you uh, prefer a single fixed monitoring station per farm? Or do you prefer to use regional monitoring? So do you find that the uh, regional um, suction trap network is enough information for you to to make decisions. And then we have a very quick question here. 
um, just to give an indication of how much you would pay for on-farm sensors. So would you be, uh, how much as a round ballpark figure, how much would you be willing to pay every year for um, the sensing of aphids across your farm? And that just needs to be a, 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 general, a, a, a feasible figure that you'd be willing to pay. And the last question, um, what influences you to adopt new aphid monitoring systems? And again, there's a series of different options there. And please indicate whether they're not important at all or if they're really, really important to you. So is it really important that the kit is well built, designed for your farm? Or uh, is it important that it's a standalone piece or that, that can link to other devices? Is it important that uh, there's clear ongoing support from developers, that the data is easy to manage, outputs are useful? Uh, to a direct decision that needs to be made. Is it important that you have access to a demonstration of the kit or case studies? Is it uh, important that there's a link between the costs associated with setting up and financial savings or profit made associated with using the, the system? Or is it important that it's being used by lots of other farmers? Is it important that there's good advice available from independent experts, or is it really a matter of building your IPM strategy? So hopefully, I haven't seen any comments in the chat. Hopefully you're all working through these responses fairly well. That is the last question that we have uh, in the survey, and you can continue to uh, complete those uh, and then submit them at the end. What I'll do, is while the other talks are going on, I'll have a look at the, the results that have come in from that. And, um, and then at the end of the webinar, we'll go back and have a look and see what people thought were the most important uh, aspects of AFID monitoring and what systems could do in the future. So thank you all very much for, for completing that. Um, and then, So I will leave the link to that survey in the chat. Um, so anyone who's joining through the workshop can go to that link and complete the survey um, and submit it. And we'll go through the results at the end of the webinar. So you'll hear a bit more from me um, at the end. And uh, next we'll move on to our first presentation, uh, which is from uh, my colleague Sam, who's an entomologist at ADAS is looking at BYDV uh, tools. So Sam, do you want to start presenting? Uh, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, there we go. And right, oops, apologies. Let me just uh, sw <laughs> switch, switch the screen so it actually shows you the uh, thingy. Try that now. There we are. Is uh, can I just confirm that that is showing the right screen? Uh, you're you're still showing your um, PowerPoint presentation. Oh, oh so, okay. Uh, apologies. Let's try again. No, it's still it's still trying to show. Uh, is there any way to swap? Um, okay. Wait. I know what to do. Apologies. It's there we are. All right. Um, hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Sam. As Mark said, I'm one of the entomologists at uh, ADAS, um, specialising mainly in aphid control. So that uh, that might be through uh, IPM or just focusing on their virus control through decision support systems and improved forecasting. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk to you about um, a project that we've uh, been running at ADAS for three years. This is the last year of, well, the final year of the project. It's been funded by AHTB along with other um, industry bodies. The project is led by ADAS, but We've been collaborating with Rothamsted um, through their 
uh, insect survey and the virus monitoring, which you'll hear about later. So the project has two overall aims. The first is to develop an effective and economical method for monitoring aphids, uh, those being BYDV vectors. So that's uh, Repellacea from Paidae, the bird cherry oat aphid, and Cetobia novini, the grain aphid. And the second is to develop uh, decision support tools. Um, so this is to help growers and agronomists or decision makers in making management decisions for BYDV. So for the first part of this talk, I'm going to be talking about what the BYDV pressure was like in autumn 2021, and we'll focus on some of the aspects of this project that have been looking at improved monitoring. And then I'll be running through our decision, decision support tool and how it helps growers to come up with management, management decision, decisions for barley yellow dwarf virus. So, as I said, I'll I, I want to talk about aphid pressure last autumn. So, what has the pressure from BYDV vectors been like in autumn 2021? So, some of you uh, might be familiar with this view. So, this is data from the Rothamsted suction trap network from the traps in Hereford and Starcross. So, we have we have catch data in the project. We have catch data for no, sorry. So this this is showing catch data for one of the two main BYDV vectors, which is the bird cherry oat aphid. So the green bars show the ten year average, and the white line is catch data from 2020. And the red line is catch data from 2021. The point of note really is this increase in September that we see across pretty much at all sites in the UK. Um, so what this represents is um, that it's an increase in aphids being caught in the suction traps. Now it might look not look like a significant increase, but uh, you've got to, because this is a log scale, the number of aphids caught is really far greater. Um, in Starcross, it's one of the few sites that doesn't follow this trend. So it's, um, 2021 and 2020 were very similar in terms of aphid numbers, but across the rest of the country, 2021 was typically uh, had much higher aphid catches. So together with the suction trap data, we've been carrying, uh, carrying out field monitoring across sites in England to understand what the pressure is like at a local uh, at a local level. Um, so that has occurred for each of the three years of the project. At these sites, both trapping and plant counts, um, well, counts of aphids on plants took place for both of the BYDV vectors. In 2021, 46 sites were, mon were monitored. So uh, this was in Yorkshire, West Midlands, in East Anglia and in Devon. At each visit, 100 plants were assessed for aphids. Uh, the totals here are what was found at each area and the breakdown of each species. But this isn't a huge monitoring effort. Uh, th th this isn't a huge return for what is a pretty significant monitoring effort. So essentially, one aphid, we, we found one aphid for every 81 plants checked, which lends itself towards quite low pressure. So what we also did was place both water and sticky traps in each field that we, each of the 46 uh, fields that we assessed. So here we can see very different counts um, with an average of three aphids per trap. Although some traps would have had a lot more than others. Um, so this indicates that putting traps at, in fields is a more effective monitoring method. Um, So yeah, and plant counts can be a less effective because when aphids migrate onto into crops uh, in autumn, they may they settle on very few plants. So especially in times when you've got low pressure, detecting aphids on those plants relies have quite heavily on chance. Also, despite despite the southwest being considered 
for many years to be highest risk. Um, few were caught on the traps and few were caught in the plants. Um, on the on yeah, when we counted on the plants. Um, so we've had three years of quite low pressure in the infield traps and infield counts, but high pressure in the suction traps. Uh, and we're not sure the reason. And just to clarify, when I talk about pressure, all I mean is the size of the aphid population. So a high pressure would be an aphid population that is high. So we also wanted to know which is a better method of trapping. So whether suction traps or sticky traps. So because we are using both, this allowed us to compare the effectiveness, effectiveness of each method. Water traps caught more than twice the number of aphids, which reflects the trend seen across the lifetime of the project, um, where water traps have been shown to be a more effective trapping solution. Uh, and then, so when we compare across the three years, um, Doing this across multiple years allows us to gather data and compare between each year. So we can, we can, uh, the data shows changes in, in pressure, for example. So on the left are plant counts for all the sites over the last three years. 2019, uh, very few aphids were found. 2020, a lot more aphids were found. And in 2021, slightly fewer than 2020. On the right is the data from the infield traps. Um, so this is the number of aphids caught in the water and the sticky traps for all sites after the last over the last few years. For 2019 and 2020, relatively few aphids were caught, and last year we caught uh, a very large number. And as I mentioned, traps seem to be the more reliable indicator of pressure. So the trap counts that we had in the fields reflect better with the what the suction traps were finding, because both point to 2021 as being as having much higher pressure. So why might this be? So the greater number of BYDV vectors caught in the traps in 2021 reflects the warmer autumn temperatures. So. Warmer autumn temperatures means that aphids are able to colonise the crop and, more importantly, continue to create successive generations that disperse locally throughout the crop much later into the year. And as we can see on this, uh, on these three maps, the left being 2019, middle being 2020, and on the right is 2021, we can see that 2021 was significantly warmer than the two previous years. On the bright side, yeah, uh, however, so it, it looks like the percentage of aphids carrying the virus was down last year compared to 2020. What, 2020. So Rothamsted have been assisting through the detection of BYDV from the aphids collected in the suction traps. This graph shows the percentage of BYDV positive aphids across five suction traps and shows the decrease between 2020 and last year. A good point to make from this data is the differences in area it is the differences between each of the different uh, each of the suction traps. So you'll notice that Hereford and Starcross have a greater percentage of aphids with the virus than other sites, um, especially Broom's Barn, which is in East Anglia, I think maybe in Norfolk. Um, so we believe that in the West and the Southwest, there's typically more permanent grassland than in the East. And as you may know, grassland can act as a sink for BYDV um, post harvest and as a source for the virus for aphids migrating in into cereals in the autumn, which is why a greater percentage of aphids will have the virus. So now I'm going to introduce the uh, the decision support tool for our for assessing the risk of BYDV and predicting whether or not treatment should be applied. So this is the user interface for the 
ADAS Crop BYDV Assessment Tool, or Acrobat for short. Um, the finished product will be a lot more user friendly, but um, for researchers, this serves, this serves the purpose. So I'll quickly just run you through some of the inputs that um, as a grower you might that, that you will add into the tool to get your predictions. So firstly, weather, uh, well, weather projections, so that might be um, it will be can be uh, it will be your past weather and weather from for the next seven to ten days, for example, alongside. So you'll input the weather data alongside suction trap data um, from your nearest suction trap, or you can input um, data from your infield traps if that is if that is what you're doing. Then you apply cropping information such as the cereal you're, you're growing. This is important because barley is uh, barley typically suffers a greater loss from BIDV than than wheat. Um, then you enter what the estimated plant plant population will be and when the drilling occurred. The previous winter temperature, as I mentioned, is a good sorry is is a good indicator of how many um, BYDV vectors may have mi migrated into the crop and it's. Uh, and it's used to determine the following year's pressure. Um, just because, as I said, the greatest survival of the asexual forms of bird cherry oat aphid or grain aphid. Um, so then you get more uh, more migration later and later on in in the year. Then the percentage of yeah, the, the model needs, needs needs to know the percentage of aphids with BYDV. So this is key to estimating the rate of virus spread throughout the crop. Then you're adding crop agronomy information. Um, so this is used to perform a cost benefit cost benefit analysis. Um, so this determines whether whether an insecticide application is financially viable or not. And then finally. There are two factors here that are known to increase the risk of BYDV in that area, so the model takes that into account. So I'm going to run, run through some um, example outputs that emphasise the factors that are important to determining BYDV risk later in, later in the autumn. Um, as I mentioned briefly in, in the last slide, the initial infectivity of aphids, so that's the percentage of aphids that have that are BYDV positive, is key to, to determining the BYDV spread throughout the crop later in the autumn. And for these examples, the drilling date is the 1st of September. So as we can see, the timings, the, the difference between spray timings can be significant and shows the importance of understanding the actual prevalence of BYDV rather than just the number of aphids. So when 50% of aphids are BYDV positive, the spread of BYDV uh, through the crop is rapid, so an early spray is to be applied in order to knock the population out. On the other end of the scale, 1% at 1% infectivity, it can be four or five weeks before the risk becomes great enough to protect against. So this highlights the importance of knowing about infectivity um, as mistimed sprays can lead to a greater risk later in the season if, if, if you don't uh, knock out the population at the correct time. Then um, Here's another, yeah, here's another example looking at the effect of temperature. In this situation, the baselines and the slightly warmer temperature are both have predicted sprays at the same time, whereas the slightly cooler temperature, the spray is predicted about a week later. Uh, this is because cooler temperatures slow aphid development, development and reproduction, therefore affects the rate of spread um, or affects the speed at which the population can grow and move throughout 
the crop and therefore spread the virus. So it, it takes longer for the threshold to spray for the spray threshold to be reached. And then the final scenario, but this time looking at the effect of the numbers of aphids or the, yeah, the aphid pressure. So the blue line is the baseline pressure and the lines below are reductions in the numbers of aphids. So as the number of aphids that migrate in, into the crop decrease, thus the spray recommendations are also delayed. And as seen in the bottom line, with a 95% reduction in aphids, by the end of October, a spray is yet to be recommended, but the model may still predict a spray in November or December. So in order to, so those, those are example outputs for the model, but in order to validate it, we had to, um, well, we had, we had to work out if the predictions are actually reliable. So to find out, we are validating the model in three different ways. Firstly is surveying untreated crops to see if the model correctly predicts the amount of BYDV in those crops. Secondly, we're running naturally infested tramline trials that are sprayed according to the new T sum model, uh, to, to the new model and compared with the AHDB T sum model. Um, then there are tramlines that are also untreated. And finally, because in 2020 there was relatively low aphid pressure, this, oh, 2020 to 2021 to 22, we also have an unlocculated plot trial, which um, alongside four tramline trials, where we've inoculated plots with BYDV positive aphids. Um, and in this trial, we have, there are two varieties of barley. One is susceptible to BYDV, that's the funky, and one is a tolerant variety, that's Raffaella. And alongside that, we have four treatments, sprays according to the Acrobat, our new model, TESA model, calendar sprays, which is once every month, and untreated. So here are some images from the inoculated trial. Bottom left is the layouts of the plots. So at six places in each four by 12 meter plot is an inoculation point. Um, seen here is these little sort of, uh, these, these little Ringos. Um, Due to the storms that were around at that time, uh, each inoculation point had, had a little shelter to sort of protect the aphids for a few days. Within a few days, the, the, the aphids had began to move onto the barley. And in the far right, you can see at one of these inoculation points, the BYDV sim uh, symptoms becoming already becoming apparent. So it's too early to tell. Uh, it's too early to present the data, but what I can tell you is that since um, September, October last year, the TSEM tool has recommended 16 recommendations for sprays and the ADS tool has recommended seven. Which sounds good, but it, it, it will be whether this provided better or equal protection, which we'll be looking at next year. And to summarise, so this year's AFID, pre well, sorry, last year's AFID pressure has been the highest since the loss of neonicotinoid C treatments, but the proportion of aphids carrying the virus decreased between 2020 and last year. Um, field traps are more effective at monitoring for BYDV uh, vectors than crop walks. Um, we've developed a model that can guide management decisions, which may be through chemical or non-chemical control. And uh, this model is recommending less sprays than the TSUM, but um, the data from the trials this year will validate it and show whether that protection offered is a benefit. And I'd just like to thank and, uh, and acknowledge all the uh, funders and project partners and everyone who has helped with the BYDV work. Thank you. How do I, there we go. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. No worries. Thank you. Um, if there's any questions for Sam, please could you put them into the chat now? 
and um, also thank you to everyone who's completed the survey so far. Uh, I'd really appreciate a few more responses if possible. Um, and just if you're not, if you don't want to complete it, please do uh, submit the first question, which says I'm not willing to complete it. It just gives us an idea of whether people are, um, how many people are still yet to open the link and, and have a go. Um, like I say, we'll go through the results at the end of the webinar, and if we can have a few more responses, that'll just give us a better picture of where we are with things. Um, so the next presentation, James unfortunately couldn't uh, be here today, but he recorded his session, his uh, talk in advance. Um, so uh, I won't, um, I think he's going to introduce himself, but he's going to talk about the uh, Rothamsted um, uh, insect survey, surveying they carry out. So Bree, if you wouldn't mind playing that for us now. Hello, good morning. My name is James Bell. I'm head of the Rothamsted Insect Survey. I'm going to present aphids, BYDV and client services to you today as part of the ADAS aphid monitoring webinar. Now, I apologise I can't be with you today, um, but I hope the presentation you will see now uh, gives a good flavour of the work that we do. Alex Greenslade leads the aphid team and the wider aphid team have contributed to this presentation. I should say, due to file size restrictions, I'm now going to turn off my video and rely on audio only. Of course, we're here at the ADAS um, aphid monitoring event because we're all concerned about the high levels of BYTV, particularly because um, we know that warmer winters are extending the transmission period due to climate change. On average, when year losses occur, they are um, around 10% for untreated wheat, but we also know that there can be very high incidences leading to severe crop losses. Now, today in my talk, I'm going to refer to our suction traps, our 12.2 metre suction traps, which act like upside down hoovers. And um, these are collected daily in the aphid season by our team, and they're pushed out as data to our website, insectsurvey.com. You'll see me refer to that a little bit later. So from our 12.2 metre uh, suction traps, we catch the two main vectors of BYDV, um, the English grain aphid, Cetobia novini, and the bird cherry oat aphid, Ropalacifum pedi. Now, <clears throat> the bird cherry oat aphid uh, has a asexual and a sexual form, the asexual form remains within the cereal system over winter, and the sexual form returns back to the primary host. And we can detect the proportions of those uh, using colour phenotypes. So we dissect the, uh, the aphid, and then we see here the progeny here um, are dark, and that means they're remaining within the cereal system. And if they are lighter coloured, and uh, returning back to the primary host. So for the purpose of BYTV, we're not really very interested um, in, in the sexual forms that don't present a risk to cereals. We are though interested in the asexual forms. Here what we're interested in is looking at the assay data um, using the colour phenotypes that we've observed in the previous slide. And again, of course, this is for the bird cherry oat aphid and we're looking at the season autumn 2020. Before we get to the vector biology, let's look at what's happening to the temperature. So this is the Met Office data for autumn 2020. It's the mean temperature for that period. And we're using information about that season against a long-term mean. And that's for the 1981 to 2010 series. What we see in the West is that the, um, the West experiences very similar conditions to the long-term average. But to the east, where the wheat is grown, we're about half a degree above average. Now let's look at the vector information. Now there are three bars on here. The grey and the blue, we're not interested in. Uh, the grey indicates the females returning back to the primary host, and the blue indicates the number of males. What we are interested in is the serial colonizer in orange. And we see the season starts in early September and continues all the way through uh, to uh, late November. And we see a fairly unremarkable response to uh, vector numbers, uh, sort of an average season, if you like. Um, and so uh, the numbers aren't particularly large, 
and uh, they certainly die away after mid-September. So let's now look at 2021 data and we can see quite quickly um, the different season uh, in autumn according to mean long-term temperatures. We can see it's very much warmer and in the Midlands we've got uh, a rise of one and a half degrees. Now that's likely to be something we're going to see a lot more of um, in the coming years. And the response of the uh, serial colonizers in orange is quite uh, obvious that compared to 2020, we had a larger season start um, and those were much more active in the season, but then uh, they declined um, high, towards the end of September. And interestingly, the season didn't quite last as long as 2020, when here we finish uh, on the 12th of November, not extending towards the later November, as we saw in 20. 20. So I'm now going to talk about the services that we provide um, and here we're referring to the, our website insectsurvey.com you can see at the bottom of this screen. And so we have our suction trap network highlighted to the left here in the panel of uh, the UK and you can see on there the red dots. Those red dots are a suction trap location um, and we have 16 of those. Now, um, we divide our map up into the West, East, North and Scotland. And for each of those, you then choose a region, as you'll see later. You'll then arrive at a phone friendly um, weekly data, data summary. Um, and these are called completion graphs. And if you're interested in running or fitness, these completion graphs will be familiar to you. But otherwise, I'll now explain what they mean. So the number in the middle for the bird cherry oate fit um, for this site is 2,184, and that's the number of aphids caught in that week. Now compared to last week, that number is higher, and that's indicated by this uh, arrow here. Now um, the completion graph is based on our long-term data. It's a percentage of the 10-year mean. And so what we hear, see here in the season at this point is that we have expected to have caught about a third of what we think we're going to catch relative to the long term mean. So that's the bit highlighted in bright yellow and we have um, the darker yellow to go. And so you can see um, that we have the rose grain aphid, the bird cherry oat aphid and the English grain aphid. And then you can derive that information if you choose cereals, as you'll see later. Our other work now includes SMS messaging, and this is an example SMS message, and you can subscribe to this messaging service for free. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So here we arrive at our website, insectsurvey.com. Now, if you're interested in moths, um, do go to the moth data. But for the purpose of this talk, we're going to talk about the, the aphids. Uh, and here we is if we click aphids we come up with this aphid bulletin region now you'll see here um, we've got a clickable region um, for uh, west east north and scotland but i'm going to first talk about um, the aphid forecasts notice here by the way that we've got the aphid alerts the sms messaging and also for each site if you click the suction trap details you can get a map of where exactly the suction trap is uh, and you also get the time series length of that suction trap. So if you're interested in um, modeling those data, this is particularly useful. Not forgetting, of course, that uh, we have our aphid bulletin here and Alex uh, Greenslade sends this back out by email too. So if you're interested in receiving that by email, not just by the website, do email Alex Greenslade at Rothamsted. And so the aphid forecast, as mentioned earlier, now we've got agreement from AHDB who used to support this piece of work um, to host the 2021 forecast data. And if you click at serials 2021, what you'll see is the AHDB aphid news. Now, in the coming season in 2022, AHDB branding won't be included, but the forecast will remain exactly the same. And this is particularly useful for understanding when we predict the season to start for these aphid vectors and also their numbers. Here's an example of the aphid bulletin uh, and you can follow the season through. What we're interested in 
is the two species near the bottom of this table, uh, Pedi and Avini. And we can see that Avini occurs once at one site, uh, Silwood Park, uh, but Pedi is extremely numerous throughout the whole network. Now you'll see a, a reference to our live trapping, the color phenotype assays for Rhopalacif and Pedi. And here it says uh, that Rossum said uh, between two dates yielded 10 serial colonizers out of 36 aphids tested, 28%. The 10 year mean for the serial colonizers is 20%. And you can derive from that that we're above normal levels, which is useful information. Now, uh, Alex has indicated his email down here. We don't actually email the bulletin anymore, but we'll send you a link to this bulletin should you need it. Now, I showed you earlier um, the three uh, aphids in cereals, um, and that came from uh, a report that um, I derived by clicking the East region then choosing Broom's Barn, and then clicking uh, Serials. And I won't go through that again because I've already explained it, but should you want to know anything about um, Serials or indeed any other type of system, you can get the aphid species related to that there. So let's look at the text messaging now. It's really very simple. Um, what you have to do is nominate a trap, and you nominate a trap by clicking one of the red dots on the map to the right. And then uh, you can also see a text preview of the data you're likely to get um, uh, once you subscribe. So having clicked uh, that site, you then end up at a subscription page. So uh, you've now arrived at the screen where you have to enter your personal details and we are only looking to have essential information. It's double encrypted, so it's secure. And what we really need is those highlighted with an asterisk, your first name, your last name, and your mobile number. We don't necessarily need your postcode, nor your occupation, nor your company, but should you want to provide it, it really helps us. So as I said, we've selected the Brooms Barn uh, and we've given our personal details. And then all we have to do is sign up for our AFID alerts by clicking this. If you do that, you'll then receive free text messaging um, for the main BYDV uh, transmission periods in spring and autumn. Those text messages are free, as I said, um, but we limit it to those um, periods because of the cost. And on that, I'd just like to mention our funders, BBSRC, who fund our work as a national capability and thank them for doing that. So I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the session and I apologise once again for not being with you today but um, I look forward to uh, speaking with you should you want to contact me or Alex Greenslade at Rotham State. Thanks very much indeed. Goodbye. So as, um, as James wasn't able to be here today, we obviously can't put any questions to him directly. Uh, if there are any questions uh, or if you would like to hear more from him, please do put something in the chat or contact us separately. and We'll put you in touch. Um, so I pass on thanks to James and next up we have uh, Steve Foster again from Rothamsted who's going to be talking about the insecti insecticide resistance monitoring that they do. Over to you Steve. Thanks Mark. Um, just to let you guys know um, I, I'm, I'm unable to load my own slides on my uh, computer it's not playing ball so I'll be doing a quiz witty um, this morning and asking for the next slide. Um, I've been working as part of the uh, insecticide resistance team at Rothamsted now for almost 30 years, uh, monitoring uh, for uh, resistance or, or indeed looking for lack of resistance, which is more important, I think, you know, knowing that certain compounds still work or should work. Next slide, please. So one of the main players in the aphid world uh, as a pest, particularly in temperate regions, is uh, the peach potato aphid, uh, Mysis persky. And you can see here, it can come in different colors, uh, different polymorphs. Um, however, unfortunately, uh, it's not color, they're not color coded for resistance. It would make life a whole lot easier if, if they were, but um, the red ones aren't necessarily resistant and the green ones aren't necessarily non-resistant. Next slide, please. So here we see um, 
a figure showing how we plot uh, the screening, insecticide with screening bioassay data um, and actually interpret it. So in the yellow, we, we have um, a dose response um, indicating what we consider to be a susceptible baseline for the insecticide. And then um, in green, we have the response of uh, samples of Mises persky collected from UK crops. Um, and if you just click, please, you can see it over the years for this particular insecticide. And I said this is just an illustration of, of what we do and how we how we interpret it. They sit pretty much on top of the susceptible baseline. So essentially, this is a good way uh, at a, a screening dose that we, we think is, is relevant which is a good way then of actually seeing if there's any shift in uh, tolerance, you know, reduced tolerance or sensitivity or indeed resistance, which would mean that those uh, green points would be uh, lower down and to the right, and that hence indicating there may be a problem with this particular compound uh, for controlling uh, this species. Next slide, please. So just a few slides here saying, giving you the latest uh, inter interpretation and measurements that, uh, in the, from the bioassays that we've been doing over the years for Mises Persky. Good news is no evidence of any reduced sensitivity or resistance. Where, uh, in Europe, mainland Europe, we now know there's very strong resistance has evolved and this is uh, related to a target site mutation, which means that Neonix no, would no longer work against those resistant forms. The good news is, as I said, we have not seen any evidence of those forms in the UK so far. Next slide. So we'll just whiz through a few here. So we've got Flonicamid, Tapiki, and again, good news, no evidence over the years of any reduced sensitivity or resistance. Next slide, please. We also have been looking at Spiritetramat, and again, Good news, no uh, evidence of reduced sensitivity or resistance. Next slide, please. And also sulfoxaflor, uh, similar target site as the neonics, but is considered a different compound. And again, good news, no evidence of any reduced sensitivity or resistance. So this compound should work if it was used to control Mises persicae. Next slide. On the other side of the coin, we have seen consistent and widespread resistance to pyrethroid insecticides in this species. Next slide, please. Um, associated with resistance, we, we can also look for these uh, target site mutations. So once you know about a, a evidence of a resistance mechanism, you can then develop diagnostics to allow you to, uh, to screen the population in a similar fashion to uh, what Sam had just mentioned earlier with, with uh, BYDB, essentially you can screen aphids and see what their resistance genotype is and whether they carry a mechanism essentially. So we, we, in the past, we've been looking for MACE, which is a target site mechanism associated with resistance to primicarb, AFOX, but that has now pretty much been phased out. But we're still looking out of interest to see if there's any frequency changes. We're also able to look for KDR, knockdown resistance and super KDR, knockdown uh, resistance, which confer mechanisms that confer resistance, moderate resistance in KDR and very strong resistance to pyrethroids. Next slide, please. So um, COVID, COVID-19, you, you, you've all been exposed to the discussions and, and, and the Chris Whitty over the various months uh, describing it and, and mutations. So a couple of clicks, please, two clicks. Essentially, the COVID mutations, as you know, occur in the huge population of viruses and then new strains uh, come into the fore and are selected because they have high fitness and they, they, they do well, you know, Kent, Delta, Omicron. Well, in parallel, insecticide resistant mutations, the situation is, is exactly the same. Large population size, pest population, in this case aphids, mutations occurring, and then they're being selected for their success in the presence of, in, in, of the insecticides that the mutation confers resistance to. So this illustrates, like with COVID, it's important to monitor, to have up-to-date data and to see uh, what uh, frequency or what type of mechanism is present in the population. Next slide, please. 
So here's some data showing, in this case, MACE uh, going all the way back to 1996. Now, if you recollect, this is a, a mutation that confers resistance to AFOX, Primacarb. And we first saw um, reasonable frequencies of this back in 1996 on potato crops. And you can see over the years it fell away and then came back to the fore. So, as I said, monitoring is important. And we, um, because of, we know the mechanism of resistance, we can monitor for it. Uh, one click, please. KDR, we've also been monitoring for that. And you can see quite clearly it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. So what you see at, in certain years doesn't necessarily reflect what you're going to see in the future. And you see, indeed, in, in 2012 and 2013, we didn't find any Mises Persky carrying this mechanism. Next slide, please. And a click, please. So here's the super KDR. Um, the mechanism that particular targets point mutation was discovered by my colleague Martin Williamson in 2012. It was a bit of serendipity, and, and I won't go into great detail, but basically in bioassays, we started to see resistance where, where we didn't see any evidence of a mechanism. So Martin went hunting for it, and he found this point mutation. So we started uh, monitoring mice uh, for this mutation. You see quite clearly since 2012 when we discovered it, it's been pretty uh, common in, in, in frequency of, of aphids in, in the UK population on, on UK crops. Click, please. Interestingly, if the aphid carries super KDI, it tends to also carry mace. So possibly mace is maintained in the population, uh, not because it's conferring resistance to a compound that's no longer used, but because it's hitchhiking alongside the super KDR. So the aphids are basically carrying both mechanisms together. Next slide, please. So Star Wars, Attack of the Clones, and a click, please. Essentially, we have what we consider uh, super clones. So basically, the population in, in, in the UK of mysis tends to be asexual, made up of these what we consider as super clones. And it, this super um, KDR clone um, and MACE clone, primarily when you go looking for this genotype, using a sort of microsat or DNA finger print approach, you find the population is very much made up of these uh, this one type of aphid. Um, so uh, this, essentially the, the diversity in the population in the UK is very limited. So essentially, yeah, it's just certain few lines have done very well. And in this case, it's probably done well because of its um, resistance to pyrethroids. Next slide, please. Um, just uh, talking about um, the difference between uh, resistance genotypes found in aphids collected off field crops, in this case, Mises, and protected crop, crops. So if you, uh, uh, one click, please. And these rarer genotypes, which we think of may, may be associated with uh, aphids that uh, are coming in from abroad, tend to be seen more often, or highly significantly more often, in protected environments like glass houses and polytunnels. So I think this illustrates if we're going to inherit neonic resistance from mainland Europe, it's probably going to come in aphids on imported plant material that then goes into glass houses and then gets out into the UK um, field, open fields. Next slide, please. Oh, and that's just, uh, uh, just illustrating the difference. Those slides, for some reason, are, are um, in the wrong order. Anyway, but just illustrates the difference in the uh, type of uh, mechanisms that we're finding currently on open crops, open field crops and in glass houses. Next slide, please. So moving on now to cereal aphids. Uh, they've been mentioned earlier, obviously. Um, important vectors of um, BYDB and cereal uh, dwarf virus. Um, one click, please. And the three main players are the grain aphid, the bird cherry, and also the rose grain aphid that also confers um, carries, transmits uh, virus. Interesting, you can see this aphid here, this female producing nymphs, and she's facing downwards. I've noticed this happens quite a lot, not only in the field, but in the lab. There's some behaviour where females like looking down rather than up. I don't know why that is. Maybe they want to see anything coming that might attack them and blow, but just an interesting observation. Next slide, please. So here we can see BYDB uh, in, in, in a cereal crop, and quite clearly, there's quite a high uh, infestation, quite a high uh, potential yield loss. 
And growers, because of the loss of the neonate seed treatments uh, a, a, a few years ago, are now very much reliant on the pyrethroid sprays. So knowing what the resistance status of these species is, is very important. Next slide, please. So um, as part of some work that was funded by AHDB that involved Bothamstead doing the bioassays and ADAS collecting the samples, um, recently we've been actually screening the population, monitoring to see what the level of resistance or sensitivity is. Next slide, please. And indeed, what we're finding in this species, in this case, Cytobium vimi, we also have another super clone, a bit like in Mises persky, and this is called SA3. And this clone carries KDR, which you recollect gives moderate resistance to pyrethroids, not strong resistance, but moderate resistance. In this case, it's in the heterozygous form. So the diploid aphid only has one copy. And interesting, we've never, ever found a homozygote out of the thousands of aphids that have been screened. So that's an interesting point, possibly because homozygotes may carry a fitness cost. Next slide, please. So a busy slide here, but basically this is, these are the data that were created as part of this work. So one click, please. And you can see at the top, these are data for cytobium. So the data in red are the baseline. So we have the fully susceptible and the uh, heterozygote. And the resistance factor, resistance response that we have is 35 fold, which is not great. It's on the edge of conferring resistance to a full field rate, but it's not dramatic like super KDR, which would give the resistance ratios in the thousands. And below that, you can see five samples that we screened uh, collected in 2019 and 2020 with various um, response ratios. But importantly, none of those response ratios were above and beyond what we saw for the, um, the standard uh, KDR um, clone. So essentially no evidence of any increased uh, selection, any increased resistance in this species. Good news. Click, please. Moving to... Uh, with palisite and uh, paid eye. Here again, we in red, we have the sta standards. And indeed, in the past, we actually saw um, this reduced uh, t uh, sensitivity in, 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 a, in a clone that gave just five folds. So there was some evidence, and indeed statistically significant evidence, there might be something going on. So this work was very much geared towards this species. So if you one final click, please. And here are all the samples that were collected. And importantly, if you look at the letters after each sample in the confidence uh, limits, you can see they all overlap with A, which is the fully susceptible. So there's no evidence recently of any either, I think, reduced tolerance or indeed resistance. So pyrethroid insecticides at present should work well against this species. Next slide, please. And here's just another graph demonstrating this. So these are the data, the samples that were collected in 2019 and 2020. And one click, please. And you can see quite clearly it over, they overlap very well with the susceptible baseline. So this is another way of, of, of illustrating the data, showing that there's no shift. One more click, please. No shift to the right beyond that purple line, which would suggest that there's, there's resistance in the population. So good news. Next slide, please. And here's here some data just demonstrating not only can we look for BYDB and other viruses in uh, Cytobium vini, we can actually test for KDR. Um, one click, please. Um, and this is work done by Martin Williamson again. And you can see uh, in this case in 2020 at York, there was a very high um, uh, frequency of aphids carrying KDR. Uh, the data aren't yet available for 2021, but Martin is working on those. Next slide, please. So just to finish off, let's have another species where uh, recently there's been uh, complaints about uh, pyrethroids not working and the suggestion of pyrethroid resistance in this particular pest, willow carrot aphid. Next slide, please. And here's another graph uh, demonstrating the samples that have been collected, actually going back to 2018. And indeed, a, a, a standard that I got from Ferrer um, in, for, collected in 2014. And the suggestion is, you can see, there is a problem, particularly, you know, the field rate. Uh, you were getting survivorship of, of these aphids. In this case, it's a glass file assay with a five 
our endpoints. Up until recently, I didn't have a susceptible baseline. However, we managed to get one. And uh, click, please. And these are the points. So you can see quite clearly that's up to the left. This has, has allowed us to calculate these response ratios. Next slide, please. And here we are. So uh, ignore the top two because that's before we got the baseline. Basically, they were the species, although they do overlap with the blue, which is the susceptible baseline, which has um, um, a, a, an LC50 of 2.42, in this case, nanograms of, of active ingredient per centimeter squared. Looking in the red, these are samples that were collected over the years. And to the right, the resistance ratio or resistance factor. And you can see quite clearly they are all significantly different to that baseline. So there is strong evidence of resistance and indeed resistance to the level that would compromise pyrethroid sprays aimed at this particular aphid pest. Next slide, please. So just to finish off, in the good old days, we had a, a, a wide diversity of compounds. Imagine that each of these tools represents a, a different compound, different insecticide. Next slide, please. The future. Well, I wish I had a time machine and I would go into the future and I would maybe 10, even 20 years and see how we're getting on with um, controlling aphid pests and indeed how we're getting on with uh, the efficacy of insecticides. Next slide, please. However, what I am predicting, and indeed is happening at the moment, just three clicks, please. We're losing, we're losing the compounds, not only through to, uh, through resistance like we've seen in willow carrot aphid, but due to legislation imposed uh, from, from elsewhere, like which actually led to the loss, for example, of the seed treatments on all outdoor crops, for the neonics. Although there is a current derogation to allow seed treatment of the neonics in uh, beet, um, in, in this country. And that's triggered by predictions made by the insect survey and first flights. The worrying thing is, we do know that strong resistance to neonics in Mises is now present very close to us. In, uh, and it was found on sugar beets in Belgium. So it's just across, just across the water. Next slide, please. So is this the future? Are we going to see this more often? And as James mentioned, not only is it we, will be a problem, I think, because of the loss um, of, of active ingredients due to resistance, et cetera, but also due to climate change, where these aphids, in this case, cereal aphids, are around for longer and transmitting viruses longer, particularly in the autumn because of warmer weather. Last slide, please. So um, I'd like to thank Linda King and Martin, uh, who are colleagues of mine who, who are actually doing the majority of the bioassay and molecular work. One click, please. And these are all the companies, the funders that are, have, have, have given money to do this work over the years, uh, including ADAS and, and Dura Crop Protection, who actually provided samples for testing. Uh, and a final click, please. I don't want to well, uh, finish on a downer, um, but as I said before, continued monitoring and tracking is very important because things can change dramatically between seasons and new mechanisms can, can evolve and spread and cause problems. But I'm afraid uh, the resistance monitoring work is uh, currently now in jeopardy due to a lack of funding. I've lost um, significant funding from, from certain participants. Um, I'm talking to AHDB tomorrow about this to see what, where we can go, but potentially I'm afraid this type of work, the monitoring could finish after May this year. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> really interesting uh, update on that one and um, and really hope that we can keep that project going. Um, are there any questions in the chat for Steve? Otherwise, we will move on. Thank you, Steve. OK. Um, so the last presentation this morning is uh, is from Mario at uh, Soric Sensors, who's going to present on a, a a new approach to aphid monitoring. Um, so Mario, are you ready to share your screen? Hello. Yeah. And hello, everybody. Hello to you. Just give me one second so I can get this up and start sharing. Mm 
Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Uh, hello uh, and good morning. My name is Mario de Miguel Ramos. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sorex Census. And yeah, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our technology, how we are approaching pest detection, particular aphid detection in a collaborative project with Radamstadt Research, uh, with uh, also some support from, uh, from AIDES. And uh, I mean, I'd like to be uh, to be to be brief and not get too too much into technical into technical details. But I definitely need to tell you a bit of our our, our technology, and hopefully you'll find it interesting. Just yes, to give you a bit of uh, a bit of background, uh, our company, Sorex Census, is a spin out from the University of Cambridge, looking to commercialize technology that had been developed in the in the university labs. We are developing highly sensitive and selective sensors uh, based on some little devices called film book acoustic wave resonators. And you can see those in the in that in that picture right there, that little gray chip uh, that you can see package uh, in, in a ceramic package there. We are at development stage, seed funded. Uh, we've raised so far uh, since 2018 about 2.1 uh, million pounds, which may sound like a lot, but for a hardware company is not that much. Uh, and we are currently working on releasing a new product in 2022, uh, focus on uh, environmental monitoring and based on a sensor array. So essentially several sensors together detecting different things. The reason why I'm here today and the reason why we joined the collaborative project with Rogamstead Research is because we also work and look into different applications uh, in other markets. Because as you will see in a moment, our technology is very versatile and we are doing work in agri-tech, uh, obviously what, what, what relates to pest detection, aphid, aphid detection, and also some work on medical diagnostics. So, just to give you, as I say, a very quick uh, background on the technology. Uh, the core device of our sensors is uh, what's called the film book acoustic wave resonator. And you may be, sur you may be surprised uh, hearing that you are, most of you are carrying this kind of devices with you at the moment. They are present in your cell phones. Uh, this kind of devices are widely used as filters, but as filters, as communication, the, I mean, as communication components that you need in your, in your cell phone. They are tiny devices, fully fabricated on silicon, which is the substrate and the material that is mostly used for any electrical circuit that you are using at the moment. And they are really, really small. Uh, I mean, we can, for example, fit 16 sensors in a two by two millimeter chip or even or even smaller. OK, so we have these small devices uh, fully fabricated on silicon that uh, we use for sensing purposes in the way that I'm going to tell you right now. So how does the FBAR sensor work as a sensor? What, uh, what we do is we monitor an electrical property of our device. This is called the resonant frequency that I'm showing you in that little graph. And the way this device operates as a sensor, whenever particles attach to the surface of the device, this resonant frequency will shift and we monitor that shift. We can make our sensors selective towards different targets by integrating a chemical layer on the top electrode of the device. That's what we call the functionalization layer. And this is key to understand how we are approaching this uh, pest monitoring, pest detection in this uh, particular, particular project. As Rodamstedt is developing layers that are capable and have high affinity towards some substances that the aphids release. And our sensor is so sensitive that can pick up the, the, the mass of these gas molecules when they are present and therefore indicate whether there is presence of aphids or not. When we compare our technology to other competitive technologies, and you may be aware of different sensor technologies being used for insect monitoring based on optical systems, for example, uh, we tick all the boxes uh, in terms of size, in terms of selectivity, in terms of sensitivity, the fact that we can be fully integrated in a very small chip, and the fact that we are very versatile. So it's quite straightforward to detect one thing and another by 
essentially varying the chemical layer that we are integrating on top of the sensor. And the most important thing is that we can do this at a very cost effect in a very cost effective way. OK, so we can really reduce the, the cost of the of the instrument. How does this look in reality and how does it look in terms of what we are providing to this project? Well, we have started working with uh, single sensor and the development kit that you can see in the picture here. This is a blue box uh, that it's about 5 uh, by 12 by 10 uh, centimeters in size, so not, not huge, that can be hooked uh, into a computer and obviously it could be also upgraded and updated in order to be able to submit signals via, via SMS, via an app, via web uh, to whoever wants to retrieve data. And uh, that, uh, I mean, that includes a number of sensors that you can see right here uh, in the in the blue in the blue plastic uh, plastic piece at the bottom. That can be swapped, uh, and that would be the ones uh, exposed to the molecules that the aphid uh, will release, and uh, the ones that would detect that presence. We are also moving into a more integrated version, uh, which we call the breakout board and the sensor array. So the development kit version two, which we are also going to test in the project. And in this case, we have essentially a three, four by three uh, centimeter circuit with a sensor on top of it that can again uh, include connectivity uh, features uh, in order to to be able to retrieve the, the data easily and in this case instead of using just one sensor we use five sensors chemically treated to detect whatever we want to detect uh, that way we achieve uh, we achieve uh, uh, we we can uh, we can get more data and uh, we can essentially use uh, use more devices in order to be able to get more accurate accurate information of what's happening. Again, advantages and if you look at these different pictures uh, comparing the size with with a one pound coin here, you can see that we have a technology that is a small and easily deployable. And as a matter of fact, in this project, we are also looking into the use case and the different possibilities and what would be more convenient for the users in order to deploy this type of technology and this type of solution. Going into a specifics about the about the project, this is an Innovate UK uh, project funded through the Farming Innovation Pathway uh, Initiative. It's a collaboration between Sorex Census and Robinson Research uh, to develop an AFID uh, detector. The initial targets that we are looking into are PFID, uh, pitch potato AFID, bird cherry oat AFID, and also English grain uh, AFID. And as I've mentioned before, ADAS is also supporting this project, helping us understand better what the market is and what are the needs of the user. Also in terms of deployment, so how should we better think about deploying our solution and, and, and making it useful for, for, the, for the end user. This is a proof of concept project. What we aim to achieve in the duration of this project, which is one year, is to be able to show that with this technology, you can selectively and with high sensitivity, detect the presence of aphids, both in laboratory trials and also small scale field trials. How do we combine efforts uh, to fight uh, to fight these aphids? Well, as I said before, in order to make the sensor selective, to make sure that the sensor only detects the gas molecule that we want to detect, we need to integrate a functionalization layer. And that's what Rotham said research develops. They develop these layers that can detect the specific gas molecules that are produced by the different aphid species. Then we integrate these layers on our tiny, very small sensors. As a matter of fact, the sensors that you see there are less than one millimeter by one millimeter in size. And with this integration, we have a selective sensor that can detect the presence of, of the insects, it providing a highly sensitive, a very versatile, small and cost effective solution for pest detection. As I say, this is uh, thanks to the technology that uh, that uh, Rodolf said research has been developing in terms of functionalization layers and the versatility of our uh, FBAR uh, devices. This is a technology that is easily deployable 
and can be easily extended to other species. And uh, when I say easily deployable is that, I mean, we are looking into options, even uh, being able to integrate it in a drone, for example, uh, integrate it in little boxes that could be deployed around the field or uh, integrate it in, in, in different machinery that uh, could be used uh, during and during harvesting and, uh, and working, working the field. As I said, at the moment, uh, we are starting the laboratory trials with, this, with the technology, and we hope that in the next quarter, we will be able to have some real detection uh, detection results using our technology combined with Rolmstedt Research functionalization layer technology. So finally, uh, this is an example of how our sensor operates detecting very tiny gas molecules and very low concentration gas molecules in a specific examples of hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. And I'm using this because this is the kind of signal that the sensor will produce in presence of the molecules that the aphids will, will generate. Obviously, uh, the end user is not interested in seeing this signal. So uh, we can, I mean, we can include or integrate this in a, in a, in a system that will essentially alert, uh, alert uh, the farmer of the presence of aphids uh, in, uh, in, the, in the case of a detection event that would look like this, okay? That's something that could be easily integrated in the electronics that uh, we are currently using for driving the sensors and producing the signal that we need. And uh, this is all from my side. Uh, I'm really, uh, I really hope that you that you enjoyed the presentation, that you found it interesting, and we really hope to be able to share some some results on real experiments detecting aphids with with our technology, and uh, the work that Robin said research is doing. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mario. <clears throat> that was a really interesting talk, and um, yeah, lots of interesting things to come as well. Um, I haven't seen any questions for you in the chat, uh, so so if there are any, we can follow this up uh, later on. But thank you for that. Thank um, you. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to thank you for everyone who completed the uh, the survey. I'm just going to, uh, and apologies, there was a glitch that I, I forgot to add one of the questions. So apologies that it didn't match what I was talking at the start. Um, I'm going to present now um, just some quick summary results from that. And it's not going to be anything you don't already know. Quite understandably, you, you've, um, there's no groundbreaking stuff here, but it's just really useful to, to reflect on where we are with these things. So in terms of, of monitoring methods being used, uh, crop walking, forecasts and regional uh, monitoring are the most widely used. And that's what was reflected in the talks as well today and what we see across the industry already. Um, there are other things used as well, but those are the three major ones that, that we, we recognize as well. In terms of the criteria for selecting aphid monitoring methods, the ones that really stood out, uh, the, the key criteria seem to be that they are easy, quick, and give real data or predict future numbers, and which indicate uh, resistance um, as well. These are the really highly valued ones. Uh, obviously, across all the, the, the factors that we put, um, they all came out fairly positive, but it, those are ones that stood out. Again, no surprises there. In terms of uh, what people see as the most feasible way of applying new sensor technologies on farm, handheld devices really came out as, a, as the most uh, clear option, um, but also alongside uh, fixed monitoring on farm, um, either per field or, or an individual point on a farm, um, and also the, the regional fixed monitoring, such as the suction trap, is seen as, a, as an important part, um, an important feasible option. So this is all kind of reinforcing things that, that are widely known already, but it's really useful just to, uh, to reflect on it here. Uh, and in terms of what influences adoption of new systems, um, really it was all the points that we we suggested but particularly what stood out was that they were well built, well built that there was ongoing support uh, it was easy to extract and understand the data um, and it linked directly to a decision that needed to be made but it was also important that uh, that it was supported by independent independent advice and that it linked to a part of the ipm strategy 
again, nothing really groundbreaking here, but it, it's just useful to to see this uh, see this kind of um, agreement across the industry. And today, we have presentations um, that looked at advancing uh, processes for predicting and forecasting aphid pests that Sam presented. Um, updating the the regional mapping using the suction trap network and other aspects that Rotham said are developing and also for monitoring resistance which is a really important part of, of aphid uh, management um, and then Maria presented what is really going to be cutting edge technology uh, on detecting aphids in the field and so I hope you all um, have been able to take something away from today's presentations and I hope that you can uh, see that there is huge scope to advance aphid monitoring and that this can be applied to other pests as well. I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but if anyone has any further comments or reflections on, on any of the presentations, please do put it into the chat now or raise your hand and we can we can come to you. Otherwise, unless there's any other comments from the speakers. Thank you all very much for your attention this morning. Um, we are running a bit short. That's that's uh, that's fine. We weren't sure exactly how how long each talk would go because we had one that was recorded that did cut things a little. But thank you all very much for joining this morning. Uh, we will try and send around some um, a summary of the events fairly soon. Um, so thank you to all the speakers, to Sam, uh, James in his absence, Steve and Mario. Thank you to Bree for supporting this, and thank you all for attending. And if you're interested in finding out more about the project or any of the projects presented, um, please do get in touch.